Okay, it's going. Uh. So, Justice League War World sucked just as much the second time. Uh, I, I feel like I, I feel like we need to start with a plot recap. Honestly, you're probably better at explaining those than I do, so I'll let you start with the plot recap. Okay, so a little bit of backstory, like um. The previous Tomorrowverse movie, um, Legion of Superheroes, has a post credit scene where, like, Batman and Superman get, like, abducted off the planet. If you turned off that movie early, you are going to have no idea what's going on here. But, like, that's your, basically, uh, uh, groundwork for going in here. So, Warworld in DC Comics is traditionally, like, a gladiator planet, basically Sakaar from Thor Ragnarok or Planet Hulk, only, like, not played funny. So, that in mind, this movie called Justice League War World opens with Wonder Woman in a Wild West town. And then the rest of the movie is just, we're jumping from, from a diff, from like, from different Elseworld story to a different Elseworld story, like, uh, like it's a, uh, like it's a DC version of Marvel's What If, and only about an hour and like, I, like, during the movie we were checking the time codes, about an hour and six minutes in is when War World actually becomes a thing in a movie, in the movie called Justice League, War World. Yeah, because the, the villain's only around for like the last 18 minutes. Like, this, uh, the movie actually starts with like, a, um, it starts with Wonder Woman in a Wild West town. No explanation why she's there. She's fighting Jonah Hex, who is a mob boss now, even though Jonah Hex is supposed to be a good guy. And it's like... We're there for 23 minutes, and that's oddly specific because, like, 23 minutes is about the amount of time for an animated episode. So I'm like, knowing that this is how the Wonder Woman movie, the Justice Society World War II was made, I was thinking, like, this is an episode of, like, an anthology series, like, trying to copy Marvel's What If. It almost, like, so one of the problems with the other Tomorrowverse movie, Justice Society World War II is that the movie is like two or three plots crammed into one, almost as if it was supposed to be like three separate episode arcs because that's of like a, a um, uh, of like an HBO Max original series for DC, and then they and then they just decided they could uh, you know squeeze it into a DC animated movie, and then that's what it was. This, this feels like the exact same scenario with Justice League War World with. The plot we just described feels like three or four episodes worth of a DC What If series that they're like, okay, we'll just throw them together with maybe a loose connection to vaguely resemble a movie that's supposed to be part of a cinematic universe. Because, yeah, like, Justice Society World War II, it's like, it's not feels like it was multiple episodes, it was, actually was adapted oh. from, like, yeah, Justice Society World War II was adapted from, like, the script for two scrapped episodes of a Wonder Woman cartoon that was supposed to go on HBO Max. So that's why that happened. So that's why I was thinking the same thing happened here for, like, a what-if story. Because, like, Wonder Woman is in a Wild West town, lets a family get killed, even though she could have intervened, fights Jonah Hex because he's evil because shut up, and then that story ends, and then it just immediately smash cuts to, now Batman is a barbarian like, who's a mercenary who gets captured, and, like, the guy who's, like, the place, the Warlord King, is voiced by Commissioner Gordon. So it's like, is he supposed to actually be Commissioner Gordon? And the, uh, uh, so... And then we're in the Batman thing for 23 minutes. And then with the Batman as a barbarian, like... So, uh, so at some point in the in the in the Batman part of the movie, he comes he he comes to meet Wonder Woman, like or so like, we're, you're you're now led to believe that Wonder Woman is now like has has come from the like Wild West uh, universe that she was just in now into this barbarian universe, but there's nothing explaining that, and if the movie wanted to make things interesting, like if they were like universe hopping. You know, maybe she she. You know, okay, yeah. Sorry, we're, we're jumping all over the yeah, place right. here, but um, the we'll get to the big reveal of the movie in a little bit. But so when, right. when this movie jumps from universe to universe, none of the characters have their memories. Uh, so, like again, if you remember that post credit scene, okay. So maybe you're thinking there's some big mystery happening. 
it would have been a more compelling mystery if, like, say, so Wonder Woman hops from the Wild West to Batman's universe, and then, and then when those two finally meet, Wonder Woman says, hey, I just came from this Wild West world, now I'm in this other strange world, here's what I know, and then, and then that starts to fill Batman in, and then when they go to eventually Superman's universe, which is basically a Twilight Zone ripoff, which is basically a Twilight Zone episode ripoff, then Batman and Wonder Woman should have been able to communicate their knowledge from their worlds to Superman. But it's like every time they hop a, they, they hop a universe, everybody suddenly forgets what they just experienced like earlier in the movie. So one of the movie's biggest problems is that nothing that happens leading up to anything actually matters. Yeah, because so like... We do the Wonder Woman thing. She's in the Wild West for 23 minutes, and then we cut over to Batman. There's this whole barbarian story where Batman doesn't actually do jack shit. Like, this Batman is a wuss in this movie. And, like, um, so that, it's like, we, we're on this crappy Batman story. He completely leaves Commissioner Gordon to die. And then at the movie's 40-minute mark, it's like, oh, hey, Wonder Woman's in this barbarian universe, too. So, like, is it the... Uh, you're starting to think like, okay, they're being put. Maybe they're being put through worlds and being tested or something like that. It's like that's the first, the first clue halfway through the damn movie of what's going on. And it's like, but you don't know how any of this works. Like, she, does she have her memories? Does she, is she starting to figure out that this is a sim, um, hallucination or like Elseworlds thing? You you don't know anything. That they don't. Ex nothing's explained of what's going on. And it's if you've like, been and if you've been paying attention to the Tomorrowverse movies. So, Justice Society World War II was an alternate universe that Flash ran into during, like, the, during the film's opening. So, the, the Wonder Woman that, that's from, ju from the Justice Society movie is not even the Tomorrowverse's main Wonder Woman. The Tomorrowverse has been, like, so all over the place that they forgot to add their own Wonder Woman. So, they had to jack a Wonder Woman from a completely different, like, multiverse thing. In, or, in order to uh, in order to establish the DC Trinity in this movie. Yeah, I swear this movie's entire reason for being is someone realized, oh shit, we forgot to actually put a Wonder Woman in this universe. We need to have some batshit story where the one from Justice Society comes over here rather than just have another Wonder Woman, I guess. <laughs> okay, and then so after the Wonder Woman universe, I mentioned earlier that we hop into like a Superman universe that... Um, I was told is just a rip, just a straight like plagiarism of um, a, a a a major Twilight Zone episode, and to to be honest, that actually is the film's only re genuinely interesting part is the uh, because it, it's so if, if you've seen the old Twilight Zone series, it's like all black and white. It's usually some like it's usually like sci-fi themed mysteries. Maybe a little bit of horror there. And this section of the movie has that for about, like, what would you say, ten minutes? If that. Yeah, so if that. And that's the movie's only interesting segment are, like, those brief ten minutes where there's actually some creativeness in it. And then that falls apart when you realize it's prob it was probably plagiarized. Yeah, um, I read, like, Justice League War World's t TV tropes page is almost blank. Like, no one wants to talk about this, and it's been out for, like, six months at least. But one of the few things it filled in is, like, the Wonder Woman story, I think, was taken from the comics, because apparently Jonah Hex's, like, trick of doing the stopwatch was pulled from somewhere, I forget where. But, yeah, the Superman story is, like, after the Bar Batman Barbarian story ends, like, they, uh, Wonder Woman and Batman walk through a portal that now exists for some reason, and now it's, like, Superman's in black and white, he's an agent who's, like, being called to investigate aliens, and it's, like, they go to a diner, they don't know who the alien is. My, um, according to TV tropes, that is plagiarized point for point from an episode of The Twilight Zone. And it's like, it's kind of an interesting mystery because you've got all these people in this bar. One of them could be an alien you don't know who, and Superman's p starting to realize he has powers. Which that's a whole other can of worms. But, like, the interest, the actually, the only actual interesting part of the movie gets cut off because suddenly Batman and Wonder Woman know something's going on, and they snap him out of it, and then it becomes like, oh, crap, now aliens are chasing us, so let's take this kind of interesting story and whoop! The, the, the one other thing that I'll give that segment of the movie... Is that um, in this in this segment there is a character by the name of Agent Faraday that is working with like you know you know Clark, that is working with Clark. Agent Faraday is voiced by Frank Grillo, which 
depending on if any of you follow the man's career, you know, he was a, uh, what was his name, Crossbones or Skullbones from, oh, Civ- yeah. from, from Captain America's Civil War. So, like, just by virtue of that man's, like, you know, kind of showing up and, oh, it, and I know him from the Purge movie, so mm-hmm. he was actually a semi-interesting antagonist. And um, you brought this up in the movie, like, he said, um, Faraday for, like, Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, who all, all in, like, civilian identities, like, they come across an alien ship, they walk out, they, and they kind of walk out of the illusion, but not quite, and Faraday is like, they're all aliens, you have to shoot them, like, the one, go- one of the precious few good nuggets in this movie is when Superman says, I'm not going to kill someone out of fear. That's not the American way. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, like, like I, I, I started going like, yes, that's good. What does it have to do with the rest of the movie, though? I know, right? Like, th- that, that tight, like, this movie is so unsure of what it wants to be. Yeah, because, like, yeah, um, cause, so, like, uh, cause once they get, um, Wonder Woman finishes her simulation, Batman ends his simulation, and, uh, like, they, um, I keep saying simulation, cause, cause, um, Yep, here's the twist. Like, the twist is they all get out, it's like, they've all been in some kind of, like, shared hallucination or simulation created by the Martian Manhunter, because he was captured by, um, some aliens on a planet, on this alien planet called War World, and, like, they've got him hooked up to a machine to where he creates projections that, like, trap people so that they can steal their, um, like, steal, like, negative emotions that power the planet for some reason. So, like, one, that means we are an hour into this hour and a half movie and nothing has fucking mattered. And two, that is point for point for point for point the plot of The Matrix. Like, people, they even have these shots of, like, all these people in pods. They're kept in, like, a simulated life to harness their power to f- power the big planet-sized machine. That's the fucking Matrix! And the other problem with that, though, is that... So, the, the movie can't even rip off the Matrix, right? So, in the Matrix, you know, all the characters are, like, hooked up in, like, these tubes or whatever. And they have, like, something, st- uh, you know, sticking into their neck. And that's what that's what connects them to the world that the Matrix creates, and that's how their energy is siphoned for whatever they need. In this movie, like yes, we just mentioned the characters are in pods, but then there's a shot of the movie where one of the characters is taken out of the pods, and then is like put into clothes and then sent off into a machine. It's like it's a. They can't decide if it's, like, um, a mental projection or a simulation or a holodeck. Like, they didn't get their own internal consistency of how this works right. And, um, my, um, you started looking it up, like, War World, I don't know a whole lot about War World, but, um, like, in, it shows up in the Justice League cartoon, and it shows up in the Superman Returns game. I know it shows up in Superman Man of Steel, the crappy Xbox game, but I haven't played that. Everywhere that it's shown up, it's like a gladiator planet. You looked it up on the DC Wiki, and there actually is, like, a story where War World was basically like this, where it's a super weapon that, like, has some kind of mental shit going on. I still don't think yep. it works the way this movie, but that that is one story from 1980. Ever since then, it's been a gladiator planet. And so before people are like, well, it exists in the comics, okay... Just because something starts out, like, early on in the history of whatever comic has been created does not necessarily mean that was all, that, that, that was a good idea from the beginning. Like, didn't you, or I think you were the one that told me that, so early on in Superman's comic career, he could not fly. Yeah. Does that mean it'd be a good idea to have a modern Superman story where he can't fly? No! I swear to God, every, t- every time... I'm going to jump topics here, but every time someone says tries to defend the Zack Snyder stuff by saying, oh, it happened in the comics one time, I, um, to, like, justify Superman killing, he's like, okay, then I'm going to make a Batman story where he's got a zebra print bat suit, <laughs> calls Robin retarded, and puts on a costume of trash to become the Batman of Zur and R because of the backup personality that he made. All that stuff happened in the comics doesn't mean anybody wants to see it in the, in the, in the second Robert Pattinson movie. Or, uh, or in another case, yes, okay, so you remember Teen Titans, right? Mm-hmm. And, and how at one point there was a character named Tara? Yep. You want to uh, you, you know a storyline that that, that, uh, that that series wisely avoided? 
There is a storyline called the Judas Contract. I, I don't know what year it came out, but in that one, there is a incestual father-daughter type relationship between Deathstroke and Tara. Yeah. Does that make it... A, okay, just because... So, again, just because it happened in the comics doesn't make it a good idea. Like, the Teen Titans cartoon did adapt the Judas Contract because that's basically okay, the yeah. only thing you do with Tara's character, but it left out the incestuous implications. And the further fucked up thing about that comic is, like, they tried to, they wanted Slade to still kind of be likable, not like he was molesting a young girl. They put the blame on Tara for in starting the relationship, like, victim shaming of the highest order. So, so again, just because something was in the comics a long time ago does not mean it was a good idea. Yeah. And it's like, as you pointed out, the way War World works in this movie, it's closer to Apocalypse. But like, and just from a visual standpoint, what they, okay, you don't even see a lot of War World. You see, like, maybe a couple of, like, laboratory and maybe one command center type area. Everything visually about War World does not feel all that distinct from what I've already visual, uh, from what I've already seen of like how Apocalypse has been depicted in other media. Yeah, there's a brief shot of the X outside of it towards the end of the movie, and like it's all lava and fire and stuff, and that's straight up Apocalypse. Like <sighs> they're not even consistent on how the fuck War World works once we get out of the simulation because like Mongol like starts beating the shit out of Martian Manhunter. He's like, "Your screams will motivate the workers of War World." Motivate how they're all in simulations nobody knows this is happening i guess maybe he might have been referring to like his white martian helpers uh, that possibly yeah that, but that, make that sense. again the movie does such a poor job of explaining everything yeah like um like even in universe like um and the wonder woman story it does such a bad job of explaining because like jonah hatch is like those people over there robbed from the bank because the bank like foreclosed on their stuff and it's like okay but the people who supposedly did the robbing are like the innocents getting shot at. So like, how? Do, I know that this is, we find out this is a simulation, and we're not supposed to care. But like, what does how? Who's the good guys here then? And another thing, like, I don't know. I admit to not knowing a lot about Jonah Hex, but from what I know, he's supposed to be a good guy. So why is he the head of like a crime ring here? Or at the very least, a hero in the vein of like Marvel's Ghost Rider. Like an anti-hero is kind of his deal. Like, so yeah, it's like, um, it's like, they, I swear they only put in Jonah Hex just because he has some kind of marketability or name recognition. And they, and they, need, and they, ha and they happen to have Troy Baker. Well, Troy Baker is like, you know, he's like Nolan North. He's in yeah. everything. Oh yeah. Okay. So again, we, a small nugget of something that's actually good in this movie at least me personally, I liked uh, Troy Baker as Jonah Hex in the movie. I would have liked it to have been in a movie that actually made a like a modicum of sense, though. Yeah, like it's a good, they're decent perform. All the voice actors do a fine job. It's just they're voicing shit. Like th they're given a script that makes no damn sense. Yeah. And, like, you know, John DiMaggio as Lobo gets, like, a few good lines. Which, yeah, Lobo's on War World. Oh, yeah, Lobo's for, also in this movie. He's on War World and working for Mongo because, pff, I don't know. Oh, yeah, by the way, Lobo's introduced to the movie when there's, like, 20 minutes left to go. And, by the way, Lobo is still on War World when it blows up, so is he dead at the end, too? Is it, I thought Lobo was supposed to be invincible. Like, I thought that was part of his character. Like, it's part of his character that, like... He was, I, I learned this from Death Battle, like, he's been kicked out of both heaven and hell, so he can't really die, or something like that. But, like, they don't, he's, they don't establish that, and, like, that's not a part of the character that's really used anywhere outside of the comics. Okay, so, in, okay, so now we're, we'll just say, so, like, in the last 20 minutes of the movie, yeah, Lobo gets introduced... And then, so you're thinking, like, okay, has the climax started? Nope! You still got seven minutes before the climax actually, actually fucking starts. Yeah, it's like, um, yeah, so, after the Superman thing, after Martian Manhunter kind of explains what's going on, it's like, um, 
Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman still don't have their memories back. They're just wandering the ship and get their costumes. They don't really establish, even by the end of the movie, that their memories have come back, which is... You know, just they a, should have by now at this point. Because, like, Bat, like um, they start getting into action and Batman throws a batarang at some people. And he's like, I just wanted to see if that did what I think it does. So it's like, they have their costumes back and they still don't have their memories. And Wonder Woman doesn't even know how to use her signature weapon, the Lasso of Truth. Like... Uh, like, Wonder Woman's acting like her using the lasso in this climax is some new thing. Which she, doesn't work, for the, it, it, based on the movie's logic. She was using it in the Wild West. Yes, movie. like she was using it during that segment, so... And while we're talking about internal consistency, like, Wonder Woman full-on has all of her superpowers in the Wild West scene, but doesn't have them the rest of the movie? And she's, uh, and when she's, like, uh, and again, the, the that breaks down the movie's logic even further, because... When we see Wonder Woman in, in the bar, in the Batman Barbarian world, she uh, she's chained up alongside I think is supposed to be a she Barbarian version of Barbara Gordon. Like 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 they're all chained up together. Wonder Woman of all people should have the strength to break free of those chains. I mean, there if we are going by old comic logic, like if Wonder Woman was tied up by a man, she like lost her powers. It was. This weird excuse to get her tied up in every issue because... So guy, we're going to use old comic book the, logic yeah, like yeah, that? Yeah, because the creator was like, I need to get boys reading this or it's not going to show. Let's tie up Wonder Woman every issue and then that boys will buy it because horny. <laughs> Which, speaking of that, the only visually... <laughs> I'm sorry, the only visually interesting part of the movie <laughs> was, was Wonder Woman dressed as a she-barbarian and Barbara Gordon dressed as a she-barbarian. Like... Like we're, like, I I think at one point in the movie, like you were uh, mentioned, like 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 you were staring at her mouth, and I was staring in the middle of her, and then uh, and then you joked, or uh, something about like, oh, I was staring at her mouth. I was like, oh, you were looking at her face, because <laughs> yeah, like Barbara, like I don't know if that's supposed to be Barbara Gordon, but she's got red hair and she pals around with the guy voiced by Commissioner Gordon, so I just assume it's Barbara Gordon, but like. The art in this movie is so bad. Like, she's got yellow face paint that disappears for certain shots. And that's what I noticed. It's like, uh, you know, like you're looking elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, like, I don't hate the art style of the, of the Tomorrowverse. The, um, the art style of the Tomorrowverse, for the most part, has actually been pretty solid. Oh, yeah, stylistically. Like, like stylistically, yeah. especially in the long Halloween, that is where the, the animation style of the Tomorrowverse really does shine its brightest mm -hmm. but for some reason the art the, the the people making this movie just didn't know how to utilize that art style very well and there are so th there are so many shots where it's just like a static picture of like two people talking oh. like you can clearly tell they keep the animation budget down which is just a face with the lip where it's lip flaps like, yeah, and that's all yeah, that flapping animation. a little bit and like they do that with uh, barbarian gordon and they do that again with mongol yeah like they're and, and, and so that stuff about, like, um, reusing the same shots of just characters, like, just staying in place, talking, reminded me of how in Michael Bay's Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, the two scenes that Soundwave is in are just him, like, floating through space and him vaguely mumbling some dialogue. He does that twice, and each time he shows up, it's the exact same shot. Yeah. So, like, I... If you're making me think of Revenge of the Fallen, you've done <laughs> fucked up movie. Yeah, like anything that makes you think of, like, the Michael Bay Rider Strike movie. <laughs> oh, yeah, because that, that was a thing. Ugh. I was just about to wonder if, like, the Rider Strike played a part in this, but I really, I, I don't think the timeline's Yeah, the up. timeline doesn't match up, but... Okay, so, back to war... So, back to, um, the... So, we are now... So... We're, we're at the climax that's, you know, 13 minutes to go, by the way. This movie is 90 minutes long, and the climax doesn't start until there's 13 minutes left. I think it might have been 11, but, like, okay. yeah, like, Mongol gets on, like, the intercom and basically announces to the planet, like, hey, I'm gonna kill this green Martian dude because he pissed me off, I guess. And Batman is, like, they're at this chamber that... You only know this if you, like, pay really close attention to uh, Green Lantern, Beware My Power. Like, the Zeta Chamber is, like, code in DC for, like, teleporting race. So, like, Bat uh, Batman is like, if we want to leave, we have to go now. It's like, Batman is the chicken shit in this movie. It's just so weird. But it's like, um, 
So then the Justice League like goes to fight Mongol, who um Mongol is he's Mongol is supposed to be like this big alien on muscular and borrowed with Superman. He looks really skinny and frail, like when and he, he like, gets the ever loving box. crap kicked out of him. Oh, yeah. And speaking of Mongol, so Mongol is supposed to be the big bad guy of of just War World itself. So you know, in the comics and and in any other like interpretation that he's a part of or any other DC story he's a part of, he's supposed to be a big baddie. So the movie called Justice League War World, thus implying Mongol is going to have something big to do with the plot. Mongol doesn't even come into the movie until about the same time Lobo comes into the movie. Yeah, when we're like 15, 18 to 15 minutes away from the ending. And it's like... So the main villain of the movie isn't even a part of the film. For comparison purposes, as long as the Snyder Cut... Act, as lo Despite the Snyder Cut being being four hours long and taking forever to set up a, a relatively standard alien invasion story, by the 30-minute mark, you had already gotten the big villain seed from Steppenwolf where, uh, where, uh, uh, where he attacks the Amazon island, or where he, uh, where he attacks them as Skira. Yeah. So, so it, it... Movie's over twice as long and still had introduced its villain earlier into the movie. <laughs> and... The movie's plot it also isn't even established until like oh, until it's, like it's you about know, the, by the, uh, right before the one hour mark. Yeah, which is still sooner than in War World. <laughs> yep. So somehow the Snyder Cut, despite being twice as long, managed to set up its plot kind of quicker than than this ninety minute movie. Yeah. So like the big reveal ends up being like War World is apparently the Death Star now, to where it's got like this super advanced weapon in it, but Mongol can't figure out how to use it, and apparently Warworld can cross dimensions now because fuck you, we need to get Wonder Woman into the main universe oh, for yeah. Crisis on Infinite Earths. Oh yeah, because there's a um, one line drop about the multiverse existing. Yeah, and it's like, apparently, and it's like, there's all these people that are in pods, and once they die, they just get cloned, and... What the fuck was the point of that? But, but then Batman says that most of the people... But then Batman has a line where he says most of these people in these pods are, are still are, are the real thing. Yeah, the originals. So which, what was the point of even establishing that they were clones? I think it but was were, just to establish why Jonah Hex is still here because when he's a, a, a cowboy. Which, he didn't need to be in the movie in the first place then. Uh, and then so during this... And then during the climax... Martian Manhunter suddenly go like suddenly goes full genocide. Yeah, like um so the way this works is like Mong um, um it turns out that like um Martian Manhunter escaped by like giving a psychic connection to Lobo. So Logo had the idea to like put in a back door so that Martian Manhunter could like free the three Justice League people because it's called Justice League War World, but it's really just the DC Trinity. And it's like so then that somehow gets uh Martian Manhunter out to talk to Mongol, to where, luckily, Mongol just so happens to have a bunch of white Martians as henchmen, and it's like, the key to opening the super weapon is, like, the Martians have it, but they didn't know they have it, but somehow John knows that they have it, and it's like, a green Martian and a white Martian have to, like, polymerization together, and that makes the key some fucking how. And... Both Lobo and Martian Manager make um, Mongol their bitch, their joint bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and then, at, like, and and I guess I might was, honestly this I could care less about this movie at this point because like you have completely Ma checked out. Long yeah, before yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. Martian Manhunter says like I warned you, Wonder Woman, you should uh you uh you uh, you should have escaped while you had the chance. I don't remember him actually warning her about that. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's like if he did warn him about it, we completely missed it. And on top of that, if Martian Manhunter is supposed to be like a valued member of the Justice League, which okay, I'm not like the biggest comic nerd in the world, but like I know for a fact that Martian Manhunter is supposed to be, like, a close-knit member of the League. He is supposed to be one of, like, the main members, regardless of whatever version of Justice League you're watching. He is supposed to be part of the Justice League. Right. And yet he is perfectly fine with killing off three of the League's biggest heroes. Yeah, like, um... Yeah, the Martian Manhunter is totally okay with, like... 
He just decides he wants to make War World self-destruct and kill everyone. All the people that Batman's... That was a bit of an opportunity to at least make Martian Manhunter look good because, like, Batman goes out of his way to spell out, no, these are real people, not just a bunch of clones that don't matter. But, no, he explicitly said, no, Martian Manhunter is committing genocide on innocent people here. So, so if we're <laughs> operating under the movie's logic, all of the characters we've seen, so, like, Jonah Hex, Commissioner Gordon, Barbara Gordon, Agent Faraday, and all these other people that have been kidnapped by Mongol like, all these other faceless people, are now dead. And it's not even clear if, like, Barbara Gordon, Commissioner Gordon, like, we, they, they never spell yeah. out, like, who's a simulation but, and who's but you, real. But you're pretty sure, though. Like, like, like honestly, we're just going to operate on, on, on this movie's, like, own logic and kind of start making up our own because... They don't, it doesn't have any logic. They don't tell oh, yeah, you what's going point. on. So, let's just assume that the movie just straight up kills... Of several major characters, and then a bunch of other character, a bunch of other faceless people, all because Martian Manhunter mumbles some vague exposition of, I do not want, you know, this weapon could fall into the wrong hands, we must destroy it. Like, there is so much techno babble through the last act of this movie, but I, I think they try to justify it with a hand wave of, like, War World gives them what they want, and then plunges them into the deep, like, it's supposed to be like, maybe War World turns them evil, so we're not supposed to care, but, like, that's not the logic Superman operates under. <laughs> And, and he's uh, and relatively maybe, okay with this. And maybe they're trying to build off a part of the Martian Manhunter character that, like, fears that fears everybody that's not his kind because everybody he's probably everybody he's ever met in his life has generally treated him with fe you know with fear and yeah. uh, uh, fear and bigotry. But again, that doesn't really if that was what they were going for, it's not brought up at all until that point in the movie. And there's also the fact that even if Martian Manhunter does believe that, Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman are in the room with him, and none of them try to stop him for one and, second. And wasn't Martian Manhunter in Beware My Power at one point? He's at the start of it, yeah. And doesn't he also forge a friendship with Superman way back in Man of Tomorrow? Yes, he does. Yeah, so like he forges a really strong friendship with Superman... So of all people, Martian Manhunter should be listening to Superman, or at least taking a look at him and saying, I do not want to kill this friend that I made, one of the only few people who did not treat me immediately with fear. Yeah, and as far as like Martian Manhunter's role in the League, um, in the DC Universe, uh, like um, the Tim vs. Justice League cartoon, like Martian Manhunter is basically the founding member who like starts the League. I know if you buy the DLC in Injustice 1, uh, Martian Manhunter's latter ending is him forming a new Justice League, uh, looking out for people. And we haven't gotten that far in The Batman yet, but Martian Manhunter, again, basically is the one going out collecting heroes to form the Justice League in that cartoon. So a founding member of the Justice League in almost every other interpretation tries to kill three of the most iconic members. Yeah, in a lot of interpretations, like, he is the glue holding the Justice League together, but now he's okay, totally, perfectly okay with genocide. And we're pretty sure that, uh, like, it's, uh, it's not made explicit, but, like, he blows up Warworld, and I, we think Martian Manhunter and Lobo are still on it, which... So Lobo he's dead. May Lobo maybe survived Martian Manhunter. There's no way. Yeah, because like the thing with Martian Manhunter is that the th his big weakness, his kryptonite, is fire. Yeah. And then, so that was a pretty big ball of fire. Yeah. No way in hell did he sur did he survive that. Yeah. So Warworld is now blow. Okay. So right before Warworld blows up, this movie has the biggest ass pull if I've ever seen one. Who was the character that shows up? Her name's Harbinger. Okay, so this character named Harbinger shows up and says, literally, is just like, you three need to come with me. And then pulls them through a portal, teleports them maybe like a few hundred feet away uh, to the uh, to the watchtower. Then they watch uh, um, Warworld blow up. And then there's some very vague exposition that Harbinger dumps on Batman, Wonder Woman, and Superman that... Something something called Crisis on Infinite Earths is about to happen. And then immediately after she dropped this mega bomb on them, the movie cuts to credits. And the movie is over. And really, like, um, the Justice League didn't really need to be there because, like, they just fight a few goons while Martian Manhunter takes care of everything. So, like, the Justice League is pretty much completely pointless to their own movie. Like... 
I get like I guess the Martian manager needed someone to like let him out of the cha chamber, but at the same time, like he does so much else through like mind control. There's no reason in universe why he couldn't have just had Lobo do that. So the the fa okay. So you know what I got. Sorry. Ugh. This movie, okay, so if you haven't heard by now, the Tomorrowverse has now officially ending um, after, well, okay, so we'll just count Long Halloween as one movie. Yeah. So after, what, six, so, well, technically seven, so there's been seven movies up to this point. Two of them were two-parter. Yeah, yeah, two of them were two-parter, that being Long Halloween. And then with the, the ending of the Tomorrowverse is going to adapt Infinite Crisis, which, a crisis on Infinite Earth. There is a sorry. difference, sir. Okay, so, you know, how, how about you go ahead and explain, because my knowledge is vague in this area. Um, crisis on Infinite Earth is basically the big story you do when you want to reboot the universe. Like, the idea is that there, I think there's, like, a villain called the Anti-Monitor who's basically trying to wipe out all of existence with, like, a big wave of antimatter. So it's this big multiversal crossover story. Um, in the Arrowverse, it was basically, like, um, they did an Arrowverse version of it where they... Be, um, they had to try and erect towers to try to hold off the wave, but it didn't work. So then they had to find, like, paragons that would um, be able to stop it. Um, it's like, it's, it's this big multiversal crossover thing. Um, so I can understand why it's being given a three-part adaptation. But basically the gist of it is usually the big, all is lost, mimetic moment from American Dad is like, um, your universe gets fucking erased, and then the climax and the res resolution is like they build another one. So it's basically like um, apocalypse. It's not. I don't want to say like apocalypse war, which basically erased everything so that nothing matters. But it's basically taking um, the universe and rebooting it so that um, whatever happens next it can be set up. And from what I understand, Infinite Crisis. Crisis on Infinite. Sorry, Earths. Crisis on Infinite Earths is supposed to be this like you know big high stakes emo you know p potentially emotional arc like you know for for all the characters involved we have had six movies uh, sorry, sorry seven movies in the tomorrowverse so far we have gotten two whole movies dedicated to batman which were really good i might add yeah the, the long halloween is a, an extremely good movie mm -hmm. um depending on if you watch it in both parts or the deluxe edition we get Man of Tomorrow, which, despite it kind of bungling the climax, is a pretty good introduction to Superman. Yeah. We do not... Okay, those are the only two characters that actually have any solo setup bits. We do not get much of an intro in Green Lantern in Beware My Power, despite that supposed to be, you know, a major Green Lantern story. Mm -hmm. We don't get that much of Wonder Woman's story in Justice Society World War Two, And... The Legion of Superheroes, unless they're supposed to be a part of Crisis on Infinite Earths, that whole movie was just a waste of time. Like, yeah. Like, I have my own issues with Legion of Superheroes, um, because, like, um, but that's a, a really big tangent off topic, but, like, even, I had a problem even in the long Halloween where that movie's second post credit scene is the Justice League coming to recruit Batman, but, like, Long Halloween is supposed to almost be an origin story where Batman is, like, coming into his own. It's way too soon for him yeah. to join the Justice League. But it's like, you have all these heroes that were, aren't really established as being experienced, and you're throwing and, them into the massive universe-saving yeah. crossover. Like, Crisis on Infinite Earths either needs to be, or should only either be a standalone thing, or have a more established cast. Like, okay, so... <laughs> When Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame, you know, uh, you know, hap you know, you know, you know, happened and everybody was seeing them, everybody was wowed by it. The reason why those movies work so well is because we had gotten like 10 years to know all of these characters. And we knew we, they were yeah, all veterans. Yeah, basically. We, we knew they were all veterans. We cared about them. We were interested in them surviving the adventure, throwing it. This would be like if the Marvel Universe, after Phase 1, jumped right into Infinity War. So it's like the Snyderverse, then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because, like, um, literally, the cast of, like, um, Crisis on Infinite Earths, like, look at this cast, like, 
Green Lantern has had like half of one movie. Superman had a movie. Batman had a movie. No one else has had like even a full movie of introduction. Oh, oh and don't they also drop in Green Arrow, if I remember? Oh, yeah. Beware My Power. Yeah. Like, like, like they drop Green Arrow into the story. Yeah, like Beware My Power is the Green Lantern story that's also a Hawk Girl story that's also an Adam Strange story that also co-stars Green Arrow for some reason. And also Vixen is in the start because the Justice League just formed off screen and we didn't need to see any of it. So they're, 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 th this big universe-ending event... Is for a universe that's barely been established. Yeah, that's been going, I think, for maybe... We'll just be generous and say, like, what, started in 2018, roughly? Um, Apocalypse War was 2020, so it's only so, been going okay. on for three years. Okay, so Tomorrowverse has been going on for three years, and they're already throwing in the big universe-ending event. Okay, so I have no evidence to necessarily to back this up, but... I would not be surprised if the reason why they're pulling the plug on the Tomorrowverse movies this early is for one of two reasons. A, maybe it's not selling very well in terms of like, all, like you know, all you know, just you know, um, gross home video sales, or it's because apparently James Gunn's new DC universe that's set to begin in 2025 with Superman Legacy. Every th every piece of media that's going to come out from DC is supposed to be interconnected, whether it's animated movies, video games, or big theatrical movies, all it's supposed to be connected. So maybe that's what's going to happen is is why it's get it what wh why the plug is getting pulled. And if that's the case, I it sucks. I will It just sucks because the Tomorrowverse had promise like so the the the, the only legit good movie in the Tomorrowverse is The Long Halloween. The other movies are varying degrees of quality. Like, they have... I'll just say, overall, the Tomorrowverse has good moments. There is potential in a major Tomorrow... You know, Tomorrowverse of... You know, D, you know, DC, you know, you know uh, of DC animated movies. But it's barely been given the time to be established. Yeah, like, um... I will say, like, um, it might be the sales thing because Green Lantern, Beware My Power, and Legion of Superheroes, I had no idea they existed until I was in a store for unrelated things and just stumbled across them. And I don't, I didn't even see any advertisements for Justice League War World either. I only found out about it because, like, viewers were saying, oh my god, you have to watch this piece of shit. But, like, um... The Tomorrowverse has, has just kind of feels, like, experimental and, like, like, Long Halloween feels like the only time they really buckled down and made a future movie, because, like, Man of Tomorrow is a good classical Superman story, but it also kind of crowbars in the Martian Manhunter. The Green Lantern movie could have been a good Green Lantern story, but they also crowbar in, like, two or three other movies with it. The World War II, um, just decided World War II was basically just repurposing a script they had lying around, and <clears throat> Legion of Superheroes. Um, you mind if I just go on my rant about Legion of Superheroes? Yeah, go ahead. Because, so... There was a cartoon, like, right before Kids WB bit the dust of the Legion of Superheroes. It lasted for two seasons. The general premise of, like, the sales hook of Legion of Superheroes is, what if Star Trek was also the X-Men? Like, it takes place in the 31st century. It's basically a bunch of superheroes form their own, like, peacekeeping core that spans the, the universe. You take a premise like that, and the Legion of Superheroes Tomorrowverse movie is, put, let's put Supergirl in a tween romance in a high school. That's what they did with what if Star Trek was also X-Men. So, like, it just, and it's felt, it's like, the, a lot of these movies have just felt, like, weirdly experimental. Like, they weren't trying to make a connected universe. They were just making random projects and seeing if they would congeal together. And the obvious answer at this point is no. Or, or maybe, like, they thought they would have more time so they could dick around for a little bit. Yeah. Like, for a few years, you know, just making a bunch of, like, weird experimental stories. But, and, th like, because the, the, the suddenness of the ending of Justice League War World really does feel like they were given the notice that the universe is ending, and the writers quickly had to write and had to, had to make a, had to make a absolute last minute script change to War World it basically, to, uh, yeah. to crowbar in a setup for uh, for uh, for Crisis on Infinite Earths. It wouldn't surprise me honestly. Like I had heard that DC was trying to do Crisis on Infinite Earths, and there to the point there were rumors they were going to do it in the DC EU before that got the plug pulled. So I think they were. Again, it's probably just like a standalone story. Like they were wanting to do another Crisis on Infinite Earths adaptation and. It ended up being like, okay, let's just put it into the Tomorrowverse, because why the hell not? 
the only hope that Tomorrowverse actually has at this point is if somehow by like by some sheer cosmic miracle that that each of the three films because Christ on Infinite Earth is going to be DC the DC animated universe you know the the, the DC animated home home movie releases uh first three part story the only hope that Tomorrowverse has is for all three of those to be the most epic things you've ever seen I hope that I hope it opens the door for more three parters because I want an adaptation of Nightfall and I know you want an adaptation of Blackest Night. Yes. So like I I hope Infinite sorry Christ I hope Crisis on Infinite Earths is successful just so it shows the DC animated universe that a three part story arc can work for these home for these direct to video releases because I have been after DC the DC uh, uh, DC for a while to make an adaptation of Green Lantern Blackest Night. Because that is one of the most epic story, epic comic storylines I've personally ever read. Yeah. And I would love for that to get the film treatment. Yeah, I also, uh, like, uh, unrelated, but I also wanted to do Kingdom Come, which I think they yeah. just said because uh, they weren't going to do because they wouldn't be able to, like, match the arts. They would. Be, they felt like they would be insulting the art style of Alex Ross, although I think that's a weak sauce explanation. But now I'm getting concerned because I didn't think of that until just now. If James Gunn wants the new animated movies to be connected to the live action movies, does that mean we're not getting Blackest and there's like zero chance of getting Blackest Night unless they want to integrate it into the new live action movies? So like I think that the like the de like the entire reason Apocalypse War was made was the animators were sick of doing like connected movies and wanted to get back to kind of standalone projects, which is Again, baffled me why they jumped into connected movies again. I'm I'm gesturing over there because we have the stack of Tomorrowverse movies over there. But like, um, it, so that kind of informs why the Tomorrowverse just feels like an experimental pile of standalone movies. But like, and now James Gunn is shooting that option in the foot again potentially if they're unless unless, unless they still because unless he's just talking about wanting consistency mm -hmm. of like the same actors, but yeah. not actually having them be connected. Which, if that's the case, okay, fine, fair, but. I just hope that with the new DC animated movies, like it, it, if James Gunn really wants to have DC animated home like home video releases that are still connected to uh, to his DC cinematic universe, I still hope he allows for the creative freedom to do like you know some like standalone projects. Because aside from having you know the the New Fifty Two connected universe and the Tomorrowverse connected universe. DC has also had a DC has also had a tradition of just doing completely standalone directed video projects. Well, yeah, they did Battle of the Super Sons, which was honestly really good, honestly better than the entire Tomorrowverse except for Long Halloween. Um, there was the Doom that came to Gotham. I wasn't wild about it, but you really liked oh, it. Oh, I love the Doom and, that came to Gotham. And I, I'll even admit, Doom that came to Gotham, like it's good for what it does. It's just it's a niche that doesn't appeal to me. So it's like. And also, they did Superman, Red Sun, the, the Elseworlds story, and Gotham by Gaslight, which are both phenomenal. So, like, I really, like, the standalone projects are A, perfectly fine, B, sometimes better than, often better than the connected stuff they're doing, because it's not being made out of obligation. Honestly, the Tomorrowverse has something in common with the New 52 universe uh, animated movies. Most of them are relatively mediocre, with, like, maybe a few standouts. Yeah, like the, um... The new 52 movies, the only ones I really bothered to own, um, I think the only one I actually own, period, is Justice League versus Teen Titans. Like, most people agree that was the standout. Well, that and Flashpoint. Yeah. Uh, I, the, I think it's debatable whether Flashpoint counts, though. Yeah, so those were standouts, and the one standout from the Tomorrowverse is the Long Halloween. Yeah. Which, to be perfectly honest, if you want to check out... The Tomorrowverse, you re honestly don't, at this point, I can't even tell you to waste your time on it. That's, that's just j just watch The Long Halloween, because outside of the post credit scene that comes at the end of, like, whether you're watching Part, part two. 2 or the full, like, three-hour deluxe edition, which combines both parts, The Long Halloween works as a very, as a perfect standalone Batman story. Yeah, it doesn't have any connections to other, or references to other, to the rest of the DC universe. For the most part, it's a very straightforward adaptation of the story. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's, I'd, I'd argue it's an improvement on the original story because the original story had a shitty ending where it's like they tried to keep it vague of who the holiday killer was or maybe there were multiples of them, but either way, the killer, it's, kind of hinted escapes justice but like 
Long Halloween is like the movie is like no screw that we're actually we're, we're actually going to answer who it is, <laughs> and with some actual clues in the middle to back it up. So the the actually, be, the, the best I got with with Justice League War World and just the coming Crisis on Infinite Earths movie is this is just a sad end to a universe I genuinely had some hope for. Yeah, like, I ended, I ended the Apocalypse War episode of my show with genuine hope that the Tomorrowverse would, like, get back to classical superhero stories and be a good universe, and that hope has been, turned to shit. <laughs> yeah, this is just... Honestly, watching Justice League War World and doing this discussion has just kind of felt like us trying to do a funeral for the, like... Kind of a funeral service for the Tomorrowverse. Yeah, like we st we went into this wanting to just talk about Warworld because it was a pile of shit, but yeah, it has turned into a eulogy for the Tomorrowverse at this point. Because like, because it's it, it's a universe that started out with promise. Like, okay, so if you can see my hand, here is Man of Tomorrow. So like, it's okay, but it's got some, but, but but overall a fine movie, and the, and then the quality goes straight up. With the long Halloween, and then when the next Tomorrowverse movie came out, which was what, just Society of World War II? Uh, Society of World War II was before long okay, Halloween. So, okay, so, so then... It was, so it was kind so of went from here to, to about here, here and then to here. here, and then immediately back <laughs> down like that, and just then, like that. I'd argue Legion of Superheroes was a little better than Beware My Power, just because Beware My Power was kind of overstuffed, I need to revisit that one, and then it went... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just crashed and burned into a fiery pit, yeah. and... I'm not even, honestly, I'm not even confident that Christ on Infinite Earths is going to be able to pull the Tomorrowverse out of the pit. I, yeah, I I don't know. Like, all we really know about it so far is, like, the cover, like, the box art for part one has, like, the, um, the, um, the evil Justice League from, like, Crisis on Two Earths, where they're all, like, mm -hmm. evil mob boss. So I guess that's probably... <laughs> I was, I'd say that's probably going to be a focus, but Jonah Hex is on the cover of War yeah. World, and you see how that turned out. <laughs> The the only thing that the Christ and Infinite Earth movies can do that would be interesting is a, is a what they tried to do because it's supposed to be a multiverse story from what I understand mm -hmm. is that they try to pull like other interpret other DC animated universes together like I think it'd be cool if they tried to pull in the Timber like the Bruce Timverse and like the Batman and then the animated the Batman universe and um, other like you know DC animated universes together like. You know, but, yeah. e even aspects of the New 52 universe. Big problem if they wanted to include the Tim versus, unfortunately, yeah, Kevin, Kevin Conroy's no longer with us. Yeah, but, Kevin like, Conroy's no longer with us. And if they were going to use the Joker, they're sure as shit not going to get Mark Hamill because Mark Hamill has flat out said that he does not want to do any more DC animated projects, especially not with not not without Kevin Conroy. Well, the thing is, like, um, the Crisis on Infinite Earths that they did with the Flash, um, the Fla uh, Fla the Arrowverse, the uh, Flash TV show, um, it had camp appearances for like the reporter Knox from Batman '89 showed up, Burt Ward from um, the Adam West universe showed up. Like he has one, he goes, "Holy crimson skies of death." <laughs> They had Huntress from the Birds of Prey show that sucked ass showed up. Um, Brandon Routh implying, uh, basically all out stating that he's a Christopher Reeves Superman is represented. Um, Kevin Conroy shows up as like... Um, Did you kind of say the Kingdom Come Batman? And he has the appearance of Kingdom Come Batman, but it's more. it turns out it's more like Dark Knight Returns Batman. Um, they have like, they use stock footage for it, but Doom Patrol and Titans are represented in it. Through stock footage, um, God, I forget what else, but um, but in other words, that it's still like seven universes from DC represented, um, and then technically at the time, Black Lightning and Supergirl were different universes, so that makes nine. But those were still shows they had running at the time, so do it that what you will. But like, um, so yeah, they could do a Crisis on Infinite. We're setting ourselves up for disappointment, like we did with the Flash, but like they could like. They could get Reno Romano from the Batman cartoon series. Yep. They could get most of the cast of Justice League from the Timverse. Again, Kevin Conroy is very glaringly absent. Unless I don't, I think they're too respectful to use just stock audio of. They him. better not. Or they could have him appear but not speak. But that just yeah. be fucking depressing. Yes. Um, they could have. I, it's never going to happen in a million years. They could have Beware the Batman show up. They could. Yeah. They could do that. Or they could even bring back Burt Ward as an animated Robin. Because we still got Burt Ward. I 
that I think they've specifically said now that Adam West is gone. They're because uh, uh, they had like Batman sixty six comics that were going to be printed, but they uh, they cut off that line when Adam West was gone. But like, um, they what other iconic interpretations? There's an a, there's an animated movie based on the Arrowverse called about Vixen that I have but still need to watch. They they could get the Arrowverse people back um, in animated form, and they could even you know bring back like the original Teen Titans. <laughs> I just realized, like, if they do have the Arrowverse people have the Flash come in, Grant Gustin's Flash come in and go, Oh, fuck, not this again! <laughs> <laughs> or they could bring in, like, the original, like, I don't know, cast from the Teen Titans cartoon, because I think most of them are still around. Well, hell, they did a crossover movie of Teen Titans meets Teen Titans Go. They could get both of them. Fuck, I... I don't like Teen Titans Go, but someone will get a kick out of it. So, like... That's what Crisis is for! Like, 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 like Christ on Infinite Earth is a license to do to just do fan service out the ass. This, yeah. and, and so, that's what the, that's what these Christ on Infinite Earth Tomorrowverse movies are gonna have to do to be successful. They're just gonna need to throw every bit of fan service they can, that is humanly possible. Yeah. Like, I know people complain about if a movie is built entirely on fan service... But at this point, the Tomorrowverse has nothing left going for it other than to reach for just, che- I, ha- I hate to put it this way, cheap nostalgia bait. I mean, honestly, like... Or, or hey, hey, they could get Clancy Brown as Lex Luthor, too. Yeah, you know, they could get Clancy Brown as Lex Luthor and Clancy Brown as Mr. Freeze. <laughs> who the fuck else is he voiced for DC? <laughs> Or, 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 or Kevin Michael Rich. Uh, so like, if if they can't get Mark Hamill, you know, you could get Kevin Michael Richardson's Joker. Mm-hmm. And if you want to throw in another Joker, you could fuck it. Throw in Troy Baker's Joker. I just had the funny thought of like, okay, you know that uh, you know, you you've seen Superman four, so you know this. Get the Clancy Brown from the DC um, animated universe and the Clancy Brown from the Batman. They're both voiced by Clancy Brown. <laughs> so I'm just like, you have my voice. No, you have my voice. Oh, kind of like that. Oh, exactly oh, oh, oh. like in Superman Four. Or kind of like that. <laughs> or kind of like that Family Guy bit between Doctor Hartman and Carter. Exactly like that. Yes. Uh, well, I think I've said my piece on Justice League War World and, frankly, yeah. the Tomorrowverse in general. Yeah. Do you have any pleasant words for us to go out on? There was um, there was one funny part in Justice League War. Oh World. yes, actually, yes. Explain two, the, explain there were two that. funny parts actually. Um, the first time you got a kick out of like when the brainwashed League members like their costumes come down and Batman's like, apparently I'm very particular about how I dress, <laughs> uh, which you didn't crack a smile at this time because <laughs> we were both like losing our minds at it. But like, um, there's um, an ungodly cheap part of War World, which again tells you just how done they were. Where it's like there's someone in the monitor security monitor going breaches on levels two, three, and four. Like um, um, this the security gate was lifted up, and Lobo's like, "Yep, that'd be Superman or Wonder Woman, not <laughs> Batman though. That'd screw up his back." <laughs> and, and and then when when one of us had to take like a quick break from the movie, when we paused the movie. These characters had like completely stupid, dumb, founded looks on their faces. Like, Superman looked pissed off, and the caption was literally, I don't understand. And I feel like that's just a perfect representation of this movie is that, that freeze frame that we both took a picture of, um, where, where Superman is saying, I don't understand what's happening, is a perfect metaphor for the entire for the entirety of Justice League War World. There was, um, you wanted me to read the... Oh, plot. yes, yeah, yes. The Listen to this plot description and tell us if this sounds anything like, like like what we were just reviewing. This is the actual plot synopsis on Letterboxd. Three heroes, three worlds, one salvation. Until now, the Justice League has been a loose association of super-powered individuals. But when they are swept away to War World, a place of unending, brutal, gladiatorial combat... No, it's fucking not. <laughs> Superman... Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, and the others, what others, must somehow unite to form an unbeatable resistance able to lead an entire what planet was, to freedom. What resistance? Where the fuck did they get that description? Like, what? DC couldn't have provided that synopsis because that is, there's nothing gladiatorial about War that, World. In that this is just, movie. that's just blatant false advertising. Like, like, th- that's more misrepresentation of a product than, like, the Aliens Colonial Marines pre-release hype. 
I, I legitimately want to know who gave them that synopsis. Like, okay. was like was that just, like, an alternate script for the movie at one point until it got hastily rewritten? Like, was that the pitch that they started with before the writers said, Ah, oh, that's boring. Let's do this fucking Elseworlds because maybe we have these rejected scripts lying around. It wouldn't surprise me at this point. But, like... This kind, this video kind of turned into a eulogy for yeah. the Tomorrowverse in general, and it's like just wasted potential, top to bottom, in the most disappointing way, you know. So to quote Peter Griffin from Family Guy after he watched whatever movie you want to say he was watching, done. I forget what movie that was. Yep, done. Yep. <sighs> Oh, good, that was recording. I was low-key concerned that maybe I forgot to hit it. We rambled for an hour on this, damn.